So welcome. Uh, my name is Michael Kennedy, and it is my great pleasure to celebrate that you're all here to talk about digital echoes, understanding patterns of mass violence and with data and statistics. But before we begin, <clears throat> let me tell you a bit about our guest. And let me actually precede that with a framing point. Not long ago, a knowledge network to which I belong, knowing a bit of what I do, asked me to write a one-page statement about what is critical social science. And this is some of what I said. Critical social science refers to a field blending knowledge and practice that draws on a combination of normative and social theory and empirical research among people and their biophysical environments to enhance public reason and action. As a field of scholarship, critical social science draws upon various notions of the good society. Over time, its reliance on utopian inspirations has diminished in favor of more reflexive inquiries into the most just and sustainable articulation of competing goods. Human rights, equality, democracy and the rule of law, pluralism and environmental responsibility are among the pillars of that articulation. There are no empirical methods that are intrinsically alien to the field, but there are affinities ethnographic accounts that elevate human potentials for survival, resistance, and the transformation of destructive and unjust social arrangements are obviously in that tradition. Other methods are also appropriate. For instance, quantitative and systematic measures associating the timing, location, and form of human rights abuses and the distribution of military forces can be used effectively in courts of law as evidence in trials over responsibility for genocide. And then I footnoted somebody, Patrick Ball. Patrick Ball is the research director for Human Rights Data Analysis Group, whose tagline is Everyone Counts. It's a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that applies rigorous science to the analysis of human rights violations across the world. And that's something Patrick has been doing for a long time. In fact, HD RAG has its origins in Patrick's work. HD RAG began in 1991 when Patrick Ball began creating databases for human rights groups in El Salvador. After a project in Ethiopia, he joined the Science and Human Rights Program at the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 1994. Many colleagues joined him over the years, and this organization name was first used in a grant proposal to the MacArthur Foundation. In 2003, the group migrated to Benetech, and in 2013, left Benetech to become a nonprofit project of community partners. Their mission is rooted in the best of science. Quote, we believe truth leads to accountability. And at HD, HR DAG, Promoting accountability for human rights violations is our highest purpose. That's why I would love to identify this with critical social science. But perhaps it's better to say that critical as qualifier is unnecessary. This is, to my mind, the best of social science, where its excellence leads to consequential social change. Patrick himself is distinctively accomplished. In 2014, the American Statistical Association honored him as a fellow. In 2005, he was awarded the Electronic Frontier Foundation's uh, Pioneer Award. In 2004, he received the Association for Computing Machinery's Eugene Lawler Award for humanitarian contributions within computer science and informatics. And in August 2002, the Social Statistics Association of the American Statistical Association gave him a special achievement award. And he has a PhD in sociology. Patrick has spent more than 20 years conducting quantitative analysis for truth commissions, non-governmental organizations, international criminal tribunals, and United Nations missions in El Salvador, Ethiopia, Guatemala, Haiti, South Africa, Chad, Sri Lanka, East Timor, Sierra Leone, South Africa, Kosovo, 
Liberia, Peru, Colombia, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Syria. Much of this you could have learned from his website. But in order to make this introduction distinctive and value added, let me add two things that are not printed anywhere and now become publicly known. First, Patrick was in one of the first sociological theory graduate seminars I ever taught at the University of Michigan. Second, he joined me and John Guidry and Mayer Zald, plus numerous, others, numerous other scholars in a course on globalizations and social movements. And one of his early publications is found in this volume. What I am proud to say is not just that his paper is in here, but that his paper anticipates a whole career of meaningful scholarship in the public good that inspires me. But this, and this is finally, may be the first time that Patrick and I have seen each other in this century. And for that, I'm especially grateful to be able to see him again, only slightly grayed. However, you all will be extremely grateful for being here as well, for learning from Patrick as I have over these decades, and especially today around digital echoes, understanding patterns of mass violence with data and statistics. Help me welcome Patrick Ball. Wow. I hope I can live up to that. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, it is actually, it was a really big part of my eagerness to come to the conference that we're, a little meeting we're having tomorrow, uh, to come to Brown in order to see Michael again after many years because I found him an inspiring teacher. Many of the ideas that we discussed in the middle of the 1980s uh, reverberate through the conversation that we had at lunch and I think the conversation that we're all about to have now. If you would like to tweet, I encourage it, you're welcome to, please tweet at HRDAG, the name of our group, at HRDAG, so tweet at us. Um, photos are fine, out of context quotes, even better. <laughs> so have at it, folks, have at it. I'm going to start off with the punchline. I want to open up with the thing that I hope you take away from this. And this is not a point about necessarily about justice. It's not necessarily a point about accountability. It's not necessarily a point about human rights. But it's connected to all of those. And I think it's connected to the broader enterprise that Professor Kennedy has ably advanced through the course of his career, which is what is it that we do as intellectuals to advance the social good? What is it that we bring when we bring knowledge that we have uh, gathered to uh, struggles to improve the human condition. What is it? And my hope is that the knowledge is true. I mean, that seems like a reasonably unexceptional point, right? That we should be right when we make a claim about the world. But if we use data in a raw form, if we simply take a data set and then do a bunch of geoismatronic transformations of it to create an infographic, I assure you, we're wrong. Data is always lying to you. It's always lying to you. And I'm going to, through the course of this talk, give a series of examples about why that's so important, why it's important to understand that data is lying to us, and about what, in very specific and narrow context, we can sometimes do to fix it. Okay. This harks to a debate had in the early part of the 20th century among mathematical statisticians between those who thought that if the databases were big enough, and in those days, that meant tens of thousands of people in those databases on cards, on index cards. Okay. And those who said, no, the only way we can get to unbiased statistics is through a random sample of the population. Okay. The random sampling people, they won that debate. They were right. The people who advanced the argument in favor of big data, they were proven to be definitively wrong. It is very disappointing, therefore, that here, 100 years on, we are repeating that debate and indeed repeating all the mistakes that were made in the advancement of big data throughout our society. This is very problematic because the stakes are high. As Professor Kennedy said, uh, my colleagues and I use 
data analysis in the service of human rights projects. From uh, We've worked with four UN human rights missions around the world, nine truth commissions. We've built the databases and conducted statistics for nine truth commissions. We've participated in six trials for war crimes and genocide. Uh, we have supported dozens and dozens of non-governmental organizations in over 30 countries around the world. And the, there's a single common thread that crosses all of those with a, just one exception that we've ever found, and that is that all data is partial. You never have all the data. So the question I put to you is, what's the difference between the data you have and the data you don't have? Now, in human rights, we don't know what we don't know. And the reason that's a problem is that that means we don't know if what we don't know is systematically different from what we do know. Okay, that's a little on the Rumsfeldian side. But, but I warn you that that's a big deal because there's a reason you know what you know. There's a reason that you have this data and not that data. There's some process that created the data that you have. And if you take that data and do some sort of analysis with it without adjusting for what you don't know, all you're doing is modeling the data production process. Now, you can happily delude yourself that you're modeling patterns of crime when you use police databases. You're not. You're modeling what the police know. That turns out to be systematically and fundamentally different. And if there's questions in the Q&A, my more recent work is turning to US policing and the use of uh, analytics, which is a desperately horrible word, uh, and I think especially appropriate to raise here in the Watson Institute, because IBM is one of the principal perpetrators of this work. Um, we can talk at, at some length about why uh, the use of predictive modeling and risk assessment in policing is so problematic and wrong how it might potentially be fixable, but I, I'm skeptical in that case that we can fix it at all. There are other cases, though, where we can fix it. And I want to talk about those uh, in the next. I'm going to present a series of examples uh, from uh, US policing, from Iraq, from Peru, uh, and from Syria and Colombia, uh, showing the difference between what we can see and then statistical models telling us what we don't know about, and then reflecting on what those things mean, what those differences mean, uh, in terms of the conclusions that we want to draw for historical memory, for uh, criminal responsibility, and for moral responsibility for conflicts. So let me leave you with it. Let's, let's start with this idea. Let's say that we have several sources of data. In this example, three sources of data. These might be, not very hypothetically, the list of homicides collected and maintained by some country's national police force. The second source might be deaths reported in the media for a given uh, country. And then the third source might be uh, a list of homicides investigated by non-governmental human rights organizations. Okay? So we have these three lists. And our first question is, what do we know? What's known in these lists? So we, we have to determine which cases are in common. We have to not remove the duplicates, but rather integrate and link across the duplicates. This process is called database duplication. It's laborious, but it's a lot of fun. It's, one of the funnest parts of my job. I love doing it. It's got all these crazy machine learning pieces to it. It's, it's really fun programming. And so after enormous labor, we have managed to integrate these three databases, and we have established the world of the little intersecting white circles in this hypothetical Venn diagram. We're living in the world of these white circles. We know which cases are in common, okay? but we're inside the white circles. And that means we don't know whether we're living in the world on the left, where we know about a third of the reality, or we're living in the world on the right, where we know almost all of reality. Now, you might say, well, look, one death is too many. And it is. And if we're making some kind of uh, legal argument, that may be sufficient. We didn't need to do all this. We just could have taken one case and moved on. This is not necessarily an argument about magnitude. I'm not especially concerned, necessarily, with how big the gray circles are. The problem is comparison. Because it may be that if we split the world into two categories. In this case, the category, this is from Peru, people killed by the Maoist guerrillas of Sendero Luminoso in the conflict between 1980 and 2000. And it may be that on the other side, we have killings reported uh, or attributed to uh, the Peruvian army. So we may say, OK, well, we have two different sources of, 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 of violence, one from the government, one from the insurgents. And it seems that the data that we can observe suggests that the number of killings committed by the two parties is roughly the same. Well, if we made that conclusion, we would be wrong. And we'd be wrong because it turns out, after doing some modeling, and I'm going to show you a little bit how that modeling happens in some of the subsequent slides, it turns out that 
the Peruvian army, almost all the killings committed by the Peruvian army were known to these sources, were known to the Defensoría del Pueblo uh, from the government. They were known by the Truth Commission. They were known by the NGOs. The, pretty much everybody knew all the killings that the Peruvian army had committed. There were very few that remained outside that. Whereas the killings committed by Sendero Luminoso were terribly underdocumented. We had much less information about them. Now, though we had much less information, the actual number of deaths that we could attribute to the two parties was roughly the same. Do you see the intellectual error we could have fallen into? We could have said, well, you know, the parties are pretty much the same, which is kind of the favorite position of all policymakers everywhere at all times in every country in the history of the human economy. It's all about the same. Let's just create some false moral equivalents and move on. OK, but that would have been wrong because Sendero Luminoso killed uh, between half again and twice as many people as the state did in this conflict. This is a big deal because the proportional responsibility between these two parties is one of the key questions in historical memory in Peru. When we think about what happened in that war, a war that conditions Peruvian, uh, Peruvian society to this day, particularly Peruvian society outside Lima to this day, um, we need to understand this reality. Because if we don't, we're not only denying the existence of all these people killed, commit, killed by Sendero Luminoso, which is one of the effects of that, we're also misunderstanding the, 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 whole, the whole conflict. And if our job here is to clarify things, if we're participating in a truth commission, I suggest to you that our job is to find the truth. Okay? So let's talk a little bit about bias and, talk another, uh, and kind of raise the stakes again. And here I want to turn to data collected uh, in Iraq. Uh, now, this data was not collected in Iraq. It was collected in London. But it was data about Iraq. This is a, uh, data from a project called the Iraq Body Count. The Iraq Body Count which some of you may have heard of, uh, is a project that organized all the publicly available information about deaths in Iraq uh, from the beginning of the conflict um, between the Allied forces and, uh, and the government uh, with the invasion and then the subsequent occupation. And here I'm looking at data only from uh, 2006 through 2010. In fact, I'm only looking at the Februarys of those years based as a result of uh, my negotiation with them releasing certain pieces of this data. 2007 through 2010. What I, what I wanted to ask when I looked at this data is, we don't have all the data. Nobody thinks we have all the data in these press sources. So what's the effect of using the data we have as though it were a true representation of reality? How would we misunderstand reality if we used a data set collected by, from public sources as though it were on its own, without adjustment, some kind of meaningful representation of total killings in Iraq? And the answer is, we'd get it horribly wrong. Horribly, horribly wrong. So I'm going to explain to you a little bit what this, graphics, what this graph says, and then we can kind of walk through the logic here. When we talk about undocumented deaths, when we talk about deaths we don't know about in the context of a specific data project, the logic is, OK, how many sources of data do we have for, data, for, for, for deaths we don't know about. Okay, the thought experiment, we have zero sources, right? Some data, some killings we may hear about from lots of sources. We'll get five news articles. Okay, we have five sources about that death. Other deaths we may get dozens of sources if it's a very public event. Other deaths will have zero sources. So my question is, what kind of inference can we make about the deaths, the kind of deaths that have zero sources? Okay, here's how we're going to go about this little thought exercise. We're going to divide the data by event, not by individual death, but by event. So we're going to say, OK, here are events of 15 or more victims. We're going to put them in this bar. Events of 6 to 14 victims are in this bar, 2 to 5 victims in this bar, and individual killings are going to be in this bar on the far left, killings of one person at a time. And now what we're going to do is shade the bar by the fraction of killings of that size that have a certain number of sources. So when we look at the largest events, the events of 15 or more people, okay, where a lot of people get killed all at once, we find that even in the least documented cases, we have two sources. But overwhelmingly, we have 15 or more sources. Look, when a bomb goes off in a marketplace in Iraq and 20 people are killed, the whole world knows about it before dinner time. Boom. It gets covered incredibly intensely. And if we think about that for a moment, there's all kinds of reasons that's true. There's the sort of good newsworthiness reason, which is that a lot of deaths are more newsworthy, more interesting to the world. But there's also the bad newsworthiness and interest, which is that when those kinds of events happened, coalition forces brought security teams to that location in huge numbers, making it safe for reporters to report. 
They enabled the process of information generation. And therefore, we got really good coverage of it. Slightly smaller events, you can see we have a shift so that substantially more of them have, well, any of them have only one source. Some of them have uh, just two sources. And then you know, uh, many, many fewer of them have 15 or more sources. As we get to small events of two to five, well, now at this point, we're at nearly uh, about two thirds of them have three or fewer sources. And then when we get to events of size one, we see that more than three quarters of them have two or only one source. OK, so here's the question. Looking at this, can you make a guess about what kinds of events have zero sources? One until right, right. And in fact, when we do a little bit of back of the envelope modeling, which I haven't got around to writing up yet, but I'm done, we find that the probability of reporting of an event of size 15 or more is approximately one. You're going to hear about it. The probability of knowing about an event with only one victim turns out to be between 0.2 and 0.3. This is a big deal. And the reason it's a big deal is that these were two different conflicts happening at the same time. These were not just different sizes of events. These were completely different conflicts. Small events were committed by Shia militias with firearms against adult men with the, ob of the objective of committing ethnic cleansing, driving, these, driving their Sunni uh, competitors out of Baghdad primarily. That is who got killed one at a time, overwhelmingly. When we look at the large events, these are either uh, coalition collateral damage events, or they're Al-Qaeda in Iraq events, or other insurgent group events. They, they were largely committed with IEDs or with airstrikes. The victims were a random selection of the Iraqi population. And the goal was destabilization or control, depending on which of the two parties was committing it. Well, which of these stories was more interesting to the international press? All right? OK. Do you guys know, anyone want to throw a guess out about why ISIS, ISIL, Daesh is so popular in, in Western Iraq right now? Why are they so popular among Sunnis? Yeah, because those are all people who were driven out of Baghdad. Okay? They're looking to ISIS and Daesh as a security force. Now, I am not trying to draw a straight line between bad data analysis and the rise of Daesh. Okay? That's a little strong. But look, we look to data analysis as a corrective on our prejudices. We look to data analysis to let us know if we're right about our assessment in the world. And if we botch the data analysis with naive work by using the data in a raw form, we haven't just misunderstood the conflict. We have anti-learned. We have strengthened our certainty in the wrong answer. That's what naive data analysis does, is it leads to anti-learning. That's a huge problem. This is not just, a, oh gosh, more information's better. OK? No, it's catastrophic. It's catastrophic. When I used to work, I worked for a year for the UN mission in the Congo, MONUSCO. And the people who worked in the field, uh, as the field investigators at MONUSCO, brilliant, fantastic, amazing qualitative researchers. These are folks who'd been in Congo for years and years and years. They spoke local languages. Uh, they were connected to all kinds of local leaders in different communities, either sometimes armed leaders, sometimes civilian or NGO leaders, people who were really on the ground, who knew what was going on in that society. And we had these meetings because part of our, part of our mission, our mandate, was to provide protection to certain vulnerable categories of, of, of Congolese society. And this was our mission. This is what we we're supposed to do. So we'd have these meetings, civilian working group, uh, you know, civilian protection working group meetings. And we'd sit down and say, well, okay, what are we going to do? And we get this little town. We think there's a problem. We think there's an issue that's developing there. People would bring in, like, well, I think the militias are moving here and here. We've got this and that report from this militia. Other people say, well, yeah, the, the, the NGOs are getting really worried. They're hearing uh, threats. Some of their relatives in other villages are reporting this and that. And they're saying, yeah, you know, there's a certain uh, memorial period coming up where the militias may want to make a big statement. Super rich, detailed, nuanced, thoughtful, really smart thinking. And then someone would come and put a graph on the table. And it's like all the brains ran out people's ears. They'd go, hey, it goes up. It goes down. Look, it's going up. Oh my god, it's going up. It's going up. And I'm like, it, it, it's going up because we all work for the UN, right? And in the UN, if you work in a hardship post, you have to leave the country two weeks out of every eight. Okay? So a small office, okay, small office is gonna have five, six people in it. We do our best to balance who's on R and R over the course of that. But every once in a while, there's only one or two people in that office. And that's when the graph goes down, because there's no one to do the investigation. And then everybody comes back from R&R, &R and the graph goes back up. Okay? 
people's lives are in the balance here, right? Because the UN gets to decide where they're going to allocate resources in different places. And as you guys, if those of you may follow a little bit about Congo, you know that the UN does an appallingly awful job of allocating protection resources appropriately to protect people. Okay? This is part of why. This is part of why. The tyranny of naive data analysis. This is part of why. In Iraq, when we overstate the importance of large events relative to small events, we reinforce international biases. We botch it. We completely blow it. We fail to tell the right story, and we get the story completely wrong. Let's turn to police homicides in the US. Um, here's one of the rare cases where I think that rather than pattern, magnitude itself is the story. I published this work in, a, in an article a few, about a month ago. If people are interested, I, I you know, can talk. I can tweet it at you or something. But basically, here's the story. Over 15 years ago, Congress knew that the FBI's list of homicides committed by police in the United States was egregiously incomplete. I mean, egregiously incomplete. The, the FBI reports between four and 400 and 450 uh, killings by police per year. And everybody who's paying any attention at all knew that that was too low. Even 15 years ago, people knew this. So Congress passed a law requiring that uh, the Bureau of Justice Statistics, part of the Department of Justice, keep an alternative list of people killed by police in the United States. And the BJS was like, well, we're going to do that how? H how are we going to do that? I mean, we, we have no statutory capability to compel any local law enforcement office to report anything to us. Okay. So what are we going to do? So what they did is what any human rights group in the world does. They created a process to scrape the media. Okay, so you try to get every killing out of the media and get it into a database. And because they're the Bureau of Justice Statistics and they're very smart, they knew that that list was also incomplete. So they used a method called capture recapture. And I'm going to walk through after this example how the algebra works in this, in this kind of approach for a very, very simple case. But it turns out the simple case is good enough in, in this particular example because they only had two lists. So they had one list, the arrest-related deaths database, the circle on the left. And they had another list, the supplementary homicide reports from the FBI. And they were able to put those two lists together and determine which deaths were in common, and then estimate how many deaths fell outside those two lists. And they came up with, in round numbers, about 7,400 deaths over a period from 2003 to 2011, excluding 2010. It's never been clear to me why that year fell out. But that's what happened. And they said, OK, now we know there's 7,500 deaths over this eight-year period. Um, you know, let's figure out how many that is. Oh, well, you know, that's a lot more than we thought. Hmm. OK, well, that's a good start. But it turns out there's a problem. Because the method that they used is called capture, recapture. Or other, in other uh, disciplines, it's called multiple systems estimation. And it depends on a really basic probability model, a okay? very, very basic probability model. It goes like this. Let's say we have a list of deaths or of any uh, uniquely identifiable units of something. But I've spent my whole career working on homicide, so it's deaths. And this list, we'll call A, is drawn from some population N. We don't know what N is. We, we, don't, we don't have any idea how big N is. But we know that it's out there, and it does have a reality. There, you know, I'm, I'm not you know, all post-structuralist, like, well, no, 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 no. There's a number of people who were killed by the police. We just don't know it. Okay? But let's, let's see what we can do to estimate it. We have another list called B, also drawn from, M, from N. And we can put the two lists together because they're uniquely identifiable. We can determine which cases are in common between the two. We'll call that M, okay? matched. Now, the probability that a death in N is documented by A is the number of deaths in A divided by N. We don't know N, but we're just doing algebra. We don't need to know N at this point. So the probability of a death being documented by project A is A over N. Okay. Now, does that, is that clear to people? Lots of people. OK, so I won't go through the rest of that justification. Similarly, the probability that a death in, in the population N is documented by project B is B divided by N. And because we know M, the probability of a death being in M is M over N. But the probability of two events, of a compound event, an event made up of two independent events, is equal to the product of the individual probabilities, right? Assuming them to be independent. I made four assumptions in this, by the way which I'll be happy to talk about in tedious detail in the Q&A. Um, but I'm going to talk about one of them in the next couple of slides. Um, so m over n is equal to a over n times b over n, solve for n. OK, now we know something we didn't know before. Okay. We've now corrected for the underdocumentation in a and b. We now have an estimate of n. That's a big deal. 
That's a really big deal. Every time I go through this proof, I get a little tingle because that's the point of statistics. Statistics is the science of uncertainty. It is not people who hated algebra playing with Excel. Okay? That is not statistics. Okay? So what our job is is to figure out what we don't know and put some kind of bounds around it to have some sense of what the uncertainty in the, our, our non-knowledge is. Now, a key piece of the assumption of the structure of assumptions in that model is that A and B are independent. That there's no correlation in the probability that a given death in N is documented by A and B. That's totally false. Okay, that's not how the world works at all. Okay? When a middle class person is killed in the daytime, everybody's going to know about it. When a poor person is killed at night, particularly if that person is from a social network where people are afraid of the police, it's very likely to go undocumented. So if we're using data that's created from press sources and police sources, there is a strong positive correlation in the probability of reporting in those two. And we know this because we've done these kinds of studies using multiple systems estimation all over the world. And if you use more than two systems, if you use three, four, five, six, et cetera, data sources, you can actually model the correlations. You can model the failure in this list independence assumption and calculate that probability. You can calculate that correlation. And that's why you use more than two systems. Now, in the US policing case, we only had two. We were stuck. Fair enough. But we used what we did, and my colleague Christian Lum and I, uh, what we did is we uh, used the correlations from other projects from Syria, Sierra Leone, Guatemala, Colombia, and Kosovo, we said, what are all the pairwise list correlations in all of those projects? What is that distribution? And here's these little box plots here show the, the spread of distributions across those. And say, well, OK, if that's what list dependencies look like, they're almost always positive. There's this really weird cases in Syria where they're, they're occasionally negative in very, in very uh, weird corner cases we can talk about. Um, but in uh, most countries, they're almost always positive. And they, uh, for cases that we think are much, very much like the US, which I'll argue Colombia is, because in Colombia we also have really good police databases and really good press databases, similar to the US, we can figure out what that list dependence is. And if we correct for that list dependence, we increase the estimate made by the Bureau of Justice Statistics to about 10,000, from 7,400 to about 10,000. And if you walk through the logic there, that comes to about 1,250 deaths per year. If you adjust it a little bit more, because there's a bunch of jurisdictions in the United States that don't report anything to the FBI, so we're not, we have a zero probability of reporting to the supplemental homicide database, um, we get to about 1,500 deaths a year. That's 10% of homicides in the US. Let that sit in your head for a minute. Okay? I know that in America, on the right, we're really, really afraid of terrorists. On the left, we're really, really afraid of gun maniacs. Okay? Let go of it. If you add mass shooters, terrorists, serial killers together, combined, they're a fifth of police homicides. A fifth. Okay? So let's be clear about the threat to our security. Okay? If we think police are protecting us from those other things, at what cost? Let me move on to Syria. So in Syria, we have four data sets that we're working with at this point. And what we've done in these little bars is count, similar to the Iraq example, the number of sources that we have for each of these months. These are two governorates, Hama and Homs. And we're going to look at the total number of deaths reported by four Syrian NGOs that are on the ground finding out stuff. They're researching individual cases. And they're writing fantastic reports. These are the heroes in our world right now. I, I, I have no words to tell you my admiration for local human rights groups that do this kind of work. They are amazing. And what we've done in this graph is shade that this is, in December 2012 in Hama, the number of people that we, that we have documented by four sources. And this is the number documented by three, two, one, and then we've made an estimate using a variation on the math I showed for the poli policing example to estimate how many deaths we don't know about. And then there's a, there's a credible interval. It's a Bayesian estimate, so it's an asymmetric credible interval rather than a symmetric confidence interval in classical statistics. So, We've made an estimate. Now, what I want you to do is sort of, in your head, think about what happens if we only have the data we can observe. That's the top of these light purple lines. And it looks like there's a consistent decline in the number of deaths across this period in Hama. But there's a big spike in estimated deaths here in January 2013. 
So all of a sudden, this is one of these places where we get a sense where that the estimates completely diverge, completely diverge from the observed pattern. Okay. Now the reason for that, it's it, 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 returning to our toy example of A and B and M, is that A and B are staying the same size but drifting apart, and M in the middle is shrinking, which creates an increase in N. Now here's the metaphor that I sometimes use to create an intuitive sense about what the statistics are doing here. Imagine that you have two rooms. They're dark. You can't see inside them. You'd like to know how big the rooms are. And in particular, you'd like to know if one of the rooms is larger than the, than the other. Your tool for this, uh, this, this determination is a handful of little rubber balls. And the rubber balls have a property that when they hit each other, they make a noise that you can observe. So you take the rubber balls, you go to the first room, you throw them into the room, and you hear okay. You gather the balls, you go to the second room, you throw them with equal force, and you hear OK, which room is larger? Because the balls expanded. That's what happened in January 2013. Okay? The projects drifted apart. The amount of intersection among the projects declined precipitously, and then it went right back to where it was before. What might cause that? Well, as well, we're controlling for correlation. Remember, we've got we've got four systems. So, in a, in a four system approach, we're actually we, we're able to control all the correlations. So that's not a bad guess, but that is some, that's the first thing we worry about. Any other guesses? That room's way bigger. <laughs> that's what happens. This room is enormously larger than the rooms that precede and follow it. Something happened. Something happened here. Something happened historically, which created a lot more killings. But here's the thing. When there are a lot more killings, it's like our friends in that UN office in Congo. right? We don't have, all of a sudden, a much bigger budget. We have the same number of human rights investigators we had in the previous month. Our capacity to document is relatively fixed. But the pattern in violence, not fixed at all. Okay? So whenever you see crime figures that look like they're just kind of noisy and they have a general trend, remember that the size of the police department doesn't change that much. Okay? And when it starts going up, ask yourself about the budget. That's because they're adding police officers, not because crime's going up. Okay? And when it goes down, also largely vice versa. This is not always the case. New York has a divergent pattern through the 90s, but there's other ways we now analyze that. In this case, what happened is that the government retook Hamas in January 2013. And we don't actually know if the explosion in killings is the result of uh, the government killing a lot of people or the battle itself. We don't actually know the difference. We can't tell the difference between those two things. We don't even know who the perpetrators are. Our data is too thin for that. But what we can say is there's a dramatic change in the pattern of violence at that point. And that's what the role of a statistician in an accountability process is to do, is to flag what we can say and then leave it to the, to the, to the local experts to figure out what that means. We don't know. I can't reject the hypothesis that all these people were killed by the rebels as they were retreating. I cannot reject that hypothesis. That may be true. Or it may be that the, that the government came in and killed a lot of people. That might also be true. I can't tell the difference. All I know is that something that the, the pattern of killing is dramatically different in January 2013 relative to December and February. Okay. I'm going to show you a bunch more graphs that look like that. Now I'm turning to Colombia. And uh, I'm going to look at the Departamento, or state of uh, Valle, which is, Valle is the Departamento where the city of Cali is located. And I'm focusing on this, although we've done it for all of them. I've published several articles about this that are available in Spanish in uh, Colombian criminological journals. Because I've been trying, my goal here, I mean, I'm not an academic, so I don't publish academic articles. What I do is I publish things that I think will change the way the debate's happening. And in this case, we're publishing that turns out there's a journal of the National Forensic Medicine Institute, the people who collect the bodies. And there's a journal uh, published by the National Police, the people who take complaints about homicides. So we've published in those journals because we're trying to change how those institutions think about recording homicide. And I'll explain why that's so politically urgent, right, like this week, <laughs> actually, in Colombia as we go through this. So let me show you what this graph tells you a little bit what this graph means. First of all, we have these white bars. And we have uh, five sources of data in Colombia, including 
uh, NGO and press data organized in one source, uh, military intelligence databases, which record combat deaths, which are a big deal in Colombia, um, the National Police Force, which records complaints of deaths, the National Forensic Medicine Institute, which records um, the bodies. They, they, they have the cadavers, and they do cause of death determinations. Um, and the uh, National Attorney General's Office, so the prosecutors who are bringing forward homicide cases. So we took all five of those data sets and integrated them, did the deduplication thing that I showed you before, and then estimated, um, and here I'm using a different kind of representation of the estimate because I'm trying to get at the flavor of what a Bayesian estimate looks like. I'm not sure we've done a very good job. In fact, I'm increasingly convinced we did a terrible job. But in any case, uh, the white bar shows the number of deaths that we observed. And then the blue smears show the probability distribution around the estimate. The blue line is the median of that distribution. And then there's the black line. And the black line is one of the five sources. And what I'm going to do is now show you a different data source. And there's a different data source. And there's a different data source. And then there's a different data source. And another data source. So Colombians have spent most of the last 20 years arguing about which data source is right. Okay? So when you look at public policy debates around violence in Colombia, it's all about los criterios. What are you including in different databases? And look at how entirely wrong all of those databases are. None of them is telling you the story. What a sterile debate that was. That's what happens when you think you can address data quality issues by complaining about which data source is good or bad. It's, that's, not, that's a cul-de-sac. You're not getting out of that. There's no answer there. That's the wrong question to be asking. The right question to be asking is, what do we not know about? What's missing from this data? And that's what the probability estimates tell you. And one of the things that's really interesting here is if you follow the white bars, you, know, you get some kind of noise in here, but it's pretty standard. There's just a few points where it goes way up. Why would that be? Same as same, same. We have fixed budgets. We have fixed institutional capacities. So there's some variation, but not very much. But what happens is, even when there's no variation here, boom, you get big spikes sometimes that don't show at all in the underlying single data sets. Here's a single data set, huge spike. Balls are drifting apart. Something has changed. Okay? So what happened in Colombia in the first quarter of 2006 in Valle? Well, paramilitary groups were mobilized. Right? That should have been a good thing, right? I mean, that was the policy goal. If you demobilize the paramilitary groups, they should kill fewer people. Well, that was horribly naive because that's not actually what they did at all. In fact, all you really did is I sometimes refer to it as Operation Puddle Stomp because all you did is scatter these groups into a thousand tiny little groups that then fought ferociously over turf. Okay? And they killed tons of people. But the people they were killing, largely each other. So the basic structures of the state just ignored them. Massive increase in violence, pretty much totally ignored. But let's be clear, no decrease. Okay. Why is this relevant? Peace deal is on the table right now between the government and, the, and the, the leftist rebels of the FARC. Same amnesty deal on the table. What do we think is going to happen? Probably not quite the same. Um, I don't think that the cadres of the FARC are quite as murderous as the people in the former paramilitary groups, but something similar. Something similar is going to happen. Okay? And even if it's not the FARC driving it, it may be former paramilitaries who use the opportunity of the demobilization of the structures of the FARC to win the battle that they've been fighting for decades. It won't be peaceful. But it may go undocumented. Here's just another way to try to represent that. I'm still really struggling with this problem of how we explain the notion of a probability estimate to people who are not statisticians. In this case, what we have is a red line that shows the median through the lines. This, this is the same pattern from the previous slides. And instead, I'm showing the credible interval, the 95% and the 50% credible intervals around the estimate. So you can see that it's asymmetric. The density is not, is not you know, symmetric or smooth around the median. Okay? These are complicated distributions. Um, and they tend to have long, if you can think of, you, you can think of each of these bars as a histogram turned on its side. So if you turned it back down this way, you can see that the median of that histogram is left shifted. There's a long right tail. 
which means that our uncertainty about these estimates tend to, tends to be about the estimate being much, much, much larger. Okay? The possibility is that it's much, much, much larger. In this case, we have tons of uncertainty. We, model doesn't really know where this estimate is at all. It could be way up there. It's improbable, but it's, we can't fully reject that claim. In other cases, these are really great estimates given how much they are above the observed data. So we're pretty confident in this finding about how 2006 is a completely different time in Colombian history than other periods before or after. Similarly, if we look at Bogota, we have really pretty much the same time. And this is really interesting because there weren't paramilitary groups in Bogota. So where are all these killings coming from? Someplace else, maybe from paramilitary groups coming into Bogota. We're not really sure. Um, but this is crucial because as we assess the political legacy of the former president, Alvaro Uribe, one of his claims is that he brought peace to Colombia. And the, question, and the answer is, well, not so much. Not so much. Actually, there's a huge increase in homicides during this whole period. Um, this is relevant because, of course, Uribe is a frequent collaborator of Rudy Giuliani's. Now, let's get back to the big picture. There's no such thing as big data. Okay? Big data just means you have a technical problem that the data is too big to fit in memory. That doesn't mean that it tells you some truth that you didn't know before. And if you think so, you're not probably thinking hard enough about what's not in that data. Because what's not going to be collected in that big data is probably different. Now, this is different in industry context. In industry, they often do have big data. In the next slide, I'll show three ways you can get to reliable data, to reliable analysis from data. And one of those ways is to have all the data. If you had all the data, you can do anything you like. And it may not even be all that big. But if you have all of it, you don't have uncertainty anymore. At least not uncertainty that's generated from the sampling process. You may have uncertainty from other sources. Um, there is one case that I know of in human rights where we have all the data, and that's Kosovo. It took 11 years. Uh, the Humanitarian Law Center in Belgrade um, spent 11 years after the conflict working on a place that a region that is about three hours drive from their office with good roads and reasonable security conditions and a place that almost everybody's literate and had really amazing vital registration before the conflict. That's not true almost anywhere else that we work in the world of human rights. You're going to miss one or more of those conditions. So when you have perfect conditions and essentially infinite funding and 11 years, you can document 16,000 deaths. Okay? That's, you know, in, in Syria, we already have documented 250,000 deaths. Okay, that's how many we have documented. And we can't go to Syria. There, weren't great vital there wasn't great vital registration forms, vital registration before the conflict. Um, most Syrians are literate, so that's, that's a big step forward uh, because people know how to write things down, and people do write things down all the time and send emails and make you know, social media posts and so forth. We get a lot of data about Syria, but let's not confuse ourselves that because we have crowdsourcing or social media information that we're somehow uh, exhausting the universe of information. In fact, in our experience, technology tends to amplify bias. It does not ameliorate it. And it amplifies bias specifically because social media picks up on the same social mechanisms that generate information that we had before. And then it amplifies them. But it doesn't really do anything about the social dead spots where we didn't have any information before. We still don't. Okay? So crowdsourcing makes it worse. Um, and all these other sources that, that I've listed, these are all sources that I've used in my projects. These are not hypothetical. I've used data from all these kinds of places in different kinds of projects. And it's great if what you need to do, to, to do is understand a case. I want to be clear that I'm not saying that I think that the data is in any way a lie. Every single record can be true, as I think it is in the Iraq body count. Those are all really, really terrific records. They're terrific records of specific incidents. But the collection of incidents even if all the, if every individual record is true, does not make the pattern that one derives from that representative. The problem of representativity is completely different than the problem of record validity. And this is very, very hard for people to get their heads around. I can accept a fairly high fraction, 3 4% of the records being false, if I can model for that, if I have some way to model what I don't know. Okay, that just becomes another source of error. Look, point of rigor statistics to be right, or at least to know how imprecise you are. And if you don't care if you're right, why don't you just make it up? I mean, just set up a blue screen and fake a video. What's the big deal? And, and honestly, I think that using crowdsourced information to make decisions about human rights violence is essentially a blue screen faked video. Because we know it's not right. 
So why are we making policy on it? Stakes are high. Stakes are very, very, very high. If, if our arguments are delegitimized, we don't just have our careers somehow stigmatized a little bit. No, 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 no. The victims have their voices discredited. We have to take this seriously. This is a really significant moral obligation to do a good job here. So you're going to have to use a statistical model. You're going to need to do something that allows you to transcend the bias structure in the data. Remember, statistics is mostly, not exclusively, but mostly about comparison. Changes over time, comparisons among ethnic groups. When we're doing a genocide analysis, that's crucial. You have to be able to compare the crude mortality rates of two different ethnic groups. One that you, you purport or you hypothesize is the target of genocide, the other is not. If they're not different, then you don't really have a genocide finding. You have some other kind of war crime finding. You may want to make claims about regional differences or patterns over time. And in order to do that, you need an unbiased estimate of each, every single one of those points, not just one of them. It's like that time graph I showed where you needed an unbiased estimate of every single quarter in order to get a pattern over time, not just the total. You get the total as a byproduct of this larger argument about comparison. And here's the problem. There is no technology that solves this problem. This is a scientific problem. We use technology, as most science does. I mean, certainly, I, I, I really enjoy all the, the programming I do. That's the thing that I spend my days doing, and it's a, I love it. It's a total blast. But you can't write an app to correct for, for, for bias structures, because you're going to need to figure out that model, and it's going to be hard. There's no app to fix this. And in fact, technology and massive samples tend to amplify the problem. I spend a lot of time working with technologists who want to do good with technology. I come from Silicon Valley. It's, we're struggling with this. Um, and it's a bummer for technologists to realize that they're only really able to have a big input on this very specific front end collection part. But you can't then bolt an analytics module on top of that and get pretty graphs pouring out of your, uh, out of your app. That leads to the kinds of mistakes that I've been worrying about for the last few minutes. You can get rigorous statistics. There's three ways. You can have a perfect census, which, by which I do not mean necessarily only a census of populations you know, like the Bureau of the Census does, but rather if you have all the data. If you have all the data about something, you have a census. And that's what big data may think it means. And in industry context, as I said earlier, it does often mean that. Okay? If you run an, an internet service provider, you know every packet that comes through your routers, or you should. If you run an online retailing site, you know everything every customer does when they come to your site. Great. That's perfect data, and that's the domain in which machine learning models really win. But when you take that logic and apply it to social contexts, like predicting policing in particular, I think is one of the most problematic, or other areas uh, in, in the social domain where the data that we have available to create our models is a very, very unrepresentative sample, a very biased sample of reality, we are going to be really wrong. A second way to get rigorous statistics is to have a random sample of the population. Okay, and there's all kinds of different kinds of random samples. Um, but this is really hard. It's really, really, really hard to get these kinds of samples in most cases. Because in most cases, we've got this data and we've been asked to do something with it. Well, now what? Well, in those cases, you have to do some kind of posterior modeling or post-stratification of the sampling process. You have to reverse engineer the sampling process before you do the analysis. All this work I'm talking about is stuff we do before we get to do the fun part, before we get to do the part where we actually explain things in the world. We have to spend way, way, way more time fixing the data than doing the part that's the payoff. That's the part that gets us to a published article, the part that gets us to um, some kind of public policy intervention. If we fail, which is very tempting to ignore, then we're not helping. We're making things worse. Let me talk again about the stakes, and I'm going to close here. This man here is a man named Edgar Fernando Garcia. He was a student and labor organizer in Guatemala in the late 1970s and early 1980s. On February 10th, 1984, he left his home, excuse me, left his office, he left his office uh, that afternoon and didn't turn up at home. His wife, standing next to him here, is frantic. She knew the context in Guatemala at that time. People who didn't come home might have been disappeared. She looked everywhere for him. She repeatedly contacted the police and said, have you arrested him? They said, no, 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 no. We, we don't even know who this guy is. They denied all knowledge of him. Um, she created a human rights group, the Grupo de Apoyo Mutuo, which is one of the most important human rights groups in Guatemala. 
Um, and she pursued this case among thousands of others for decades. She's now a very important politician in Guatemala. In 2006, by chance, the, human, the Office of the Human Rights Ombudsman in Guatemala discovered the archives of the former National Police. Now, the National Police had been dissolved as part of the peace process in the middle of the 1990s. But their archives stuck around in a huge warehouse with 80 million pages of dusty paper covered in bat feces and dead rodents and horrible insect stuff and mold. It was horrible. It was incredibly disgusting. And I say this because I spent weeks in those warehouses working on building a random sample of those documents along with, my, with a number of my colleagues we wanted to come up with a way to statistically characterize the population of documents. And the purpose of that characterization was, well, there were many purposes, but the purpose that we ended up using it in, in, in these trials for the, of the perpetrators of the, Mr. Garcia's disappearance was to show that the documents used by the archivists and the lawyers to demonstrate that the national police had disappeared Mr. Garcia were statistically indistinguishable from the rest of the documents in the archive. Now, why is that important? This is a really important point in the establishment of the documents in Mr. Garcia's case being consistent with the pattern and practice. Those are magic words in American jurisprudence. They were not exactly the words used in, in Guatemala. But the pattern and practice of the National Police. Mr. Garcia's disappearance was not an anomaly. It was not a special case. It was not something done by rogue officers which is what the leadership said immediately when this came out. Oh, well, those guys were crazy on the ground. We, I don't know what they did. That's what the leadership always says. And the guys on the ground are always like, I was just following orders. Right? That's always the way we play the it's not my fault game. Okay? Well, these are the guys who did it. Right? They're the guys who grabbed Mr. Garcia, forced him in a car, tortured him to death, and hit his body. Okay? And when they finally got in front of the judge, they were like, Your Honor, just following orders. Okay? And, the, and she said, OK, uh, guilty. Right? That's, that turns out not to be a defense at all. But thank you very much. The combination of your claim that you were just following orders and the consistency of the documents, as shown by the statistical analysis, provided her a foundation to insist that the prosecutor arrest their boss. Whose orders were they? This guy. Okay. Hector Bol de la Cruz, who was the colonel in charge of the National Police when Mr. Garcia was disappeared. Okay. And we testified in his case as well. Okay. He was also convicted. This little girl is growing up here. And here she is embracing her grandmother, Mr. Garcia's mother, um, after the conviction of the material authors of the crime. And one of the things that she says when she talks about this case is that one of the reasons we need accountability, one of the reasons we need to do very rigorous work, she's a human rights lawyer now, one of the reasons we need to do rigorous work on this is so that loved ones know when to speak of their family members in the past tense. When do you start saying my dad was rather than my dad is? How do you know that? If we're going to win these cases, we have to get the facts right. Okay? The people that we are holding accountable are some of the most powerful people in the world. They have statisticians. And if we do naive work, we can be sure that our work will be discredited. And it's not just our problem. We're betraying her. Thank you very much for your time. Feel free to comment and questions. If there are any. Yeah. I had a couple questions. So, so one is, and I think this is really just a clarification. Um, so I'm sympathetic to your argument that uh, looking at trends and assuming that they are reflective of some actual you know, data generating process on the ground, that that, 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 that can be very misleading. Uh, well, they are representative of a data generating well, process. Right, not yes. the actual. Right. So a trend in violence may not actually be. Right. A trend, a trend and you may know the Kruger and Lund paper that just won the MPSA award on quantitative work. No, I don't know it. Yeah, just won the MPSA quantitative award showing data generating processes in Kosovo. So. This is, it is entering your field, albeit a decade late, but. <laughs> I'll have to check it out. Please um, do, yes. So, so, right, so I'm sympathetic with that. Like, it seems to me that it is uh, equally misleading to assume that because, you know, so if, it's, if the trend in the data is not reflective of a trend in 
reality, then it must be a trend in uh, you know, the capacity of the organization that is generating the data to begin with. Uh, you know, that, that's not a null hypothesis, right? That's an entirely different hypothesis that would require a different test altogether. And I'm wondering, you know, so, so when you say this is about the capacity of the organizations, is that a result of an, you know, a test of that alternative hypothesis that you've run, or is that simply inferring from what, what seems to be a, a disconnect between the trend in the real world and the trend in the data? Uh, so that, that's the first question. And the second question is, I just, and this is just really out of curiosity, you know, I wonder, so when you're running these models, right, so you've got five data sets, for example, that you're using as your, as, uh, to, to generate your estimates, sure. and you're running some Bayesian process to try to, to try to create what you believe to be, you know, sort of a best estimate from those five sources. Is that Bayesian process actually modeling the data generation process behind each of those sources, or is it simply taking each, you know, because they could have very different processes, and there's no way to know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, I, I just wonder, like, what exactly you're estimating off of in that case. Right. Okay, let's start with the first one. No, it is not a formal test. Uh, I'm not a big fan of most formal testing. Uh, this is just, this was my gut. It turns out that's what Kruger and Lum did, and they have now a much more rigorous model for that. Um, I just noticed it because I've worked in the field for 25 years, and I noticed that whenever we aren't working, the numbers go down. Police departments know. I'm just putting, you know, sure, go ahead. Right. So it could very well be that police departments are sort of aware of, you know, seasonality and crime or whatever. Oh, yeah. or, and, and so the times when the office is understaffed, well, those also happen to be times where violence is also lower, right? So everything is sort of endogenous to everything else, and it's it's right. hard to really tell what's. And, and I and I and I'm not. I mean, I would be happy to just admit that I don't actually know, but say that the police data is still flawed. There's just no way for the police data to be right. So that's all I care about. I, 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 that's all I care about. And beyond that, exactly why it's flawed? Is it because of personnel structures? Is it because of cap capacity limitation? Is it because of um, the key thing is social networks that don't trust the police, right? When people, I mean, one of the things that we know is that of all data that's known to police, about 85% of it comes from citizen complaint, 15% of it comes from police detec detection. Okay? That's just a very big picture. It varies by police department, but that in, in broad picture, broad strokes, that's what it looks like in the US. So okay, say, so, okay, that's true. We also know from comparison with victimization studies, the police know about half of violent crime. In very rough terms, in some places it's a little more, in some places a little more, less, but it's about half. So say, okay, well, we're only talking about that 15%, right? <laughs> so there's a lot of room for that 15% to increase, but it isn't gonna vary that much. So the, one of the, I think the strictest rebuttals to my work is, or to my claim about, about capacity is, well, are you saying then that the police capacity includes the switchboard operators? Right? Because that, that, the crime that's complained about gets recorded even if there's no investigation. Even if nothing else ever happens, the fact that a call came in generated a record in the database and it, that appears in the, police, in the published police databases. So yeah, so I'm happy to concede that. Um, what do the Bayesian models do? Um, essentially that, but in a crazily more complex way. So, the way that these models evolved is, uh, this is about 130 years old, okay? There's actually an argument that it's even another 200 years older than that, but it started being used to estimate actual populations, originally of fish, but then of human censuses, corrections and censuses throughout the 20th century. In the 60s, um, with the birth of log linear models, people started recognizing that we can model contingency tables with all this other more interesting stuff, right? So what people used is essentially log linear models to, uh, in a frequentist context, to estimate the contingency table of include or exclude of each data set. So if it's two data sets, you've just got, you know, one, zero, one, zero, you've got a two by two. Wait a minute, I asked for them to bring a board in so I could do this. Um, so you'd have, you know, in or out, in or out, in or out of two data sets, right? And you can organize that Venn diagram in this structure, right, where this is a structural zero. You don't know with that answer. So what you can do is not, in, if you only have two data sets, you, it's not a very interesting log linear model, but if you have three or more, you can, you know, you could create another data set down here. I mean, excuse me, another part of the table, right? So this is, there's a big one and zero up here for the third data set, and you get another table down here. You can start modeling all the marginals there. Use the marginals, actually, sorry, use the marginals to model the self counts in a log linear model. And you're always looking for the structural zero which is then represented by the intercept in those models. So with that, 
that was that 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 innovation came in the sort of early mid 70s and that's the classic you know the green bible uh bishop feinberg and holland's book in discrete multivariate uh analysis and in that book they lay it out in fact chapter six is all about population estimation using this log linear approach the Bayesians come on, and the first of the Bayesian approaches to this that I know about starts in the early 90s. And what the Bayesians say is, well, here's the problem. The problem is that when you have a log linear model, okay, what you're asking is, what are the marginal terms that you can use to predict this? You can't use all of them. right? You've got a degrees of freedom problem. So you can use the marginal totals from the pairwise combinations for two of the three, but not for all three. So which two? Okay, is it, are you just gonna do AB? Are you gonna do AB and AC? Are you gonna do, a, you know. okay. So it turns out there's seven possible models, plus the independence model, which we generally ignore because it's nonsense. So there's seven possible models, and in a three system approach, okay? So which one is right? So what I did for the first part of my career is I was stuck in this frequentist world, and I would choose some sort of uh, model selection criterion, usually a BIC. Okay? And I would choose the model that minimized the BIC, and I'd say, that's the right model. Okay? Never liked it. Because it may be that there's more than one model that have very, very similar BICs and different answers. So now what? So then Jeremy York and David Madigan came along, and they said, OK, well, what we can really do is in a Bayesian context, we can create uh, we can create a smoothed average across all the models, all the possible log linear models, no matter how many you tend to create, using the marginal likelihood of each model as the weight for that, that estimate. Okay? And that's actually the approach we're using here. This is called the DGA approach, or the decomposable graphs approach. And it's an R package, which Christian Lohm and James Jondro and I published. Um, and we implemented the Madigan and York uh, algorithm in this R package, and you can you can check it out and, and use it, and it's pretty easy to use. There's also for the frequentist stuff. There's a package called R Capture, so you can do the frequentist stuff, the classical frequentist stuff, really easily in that in that way too. But DGA is the way that we like to do it now because it gives us this advantage of being able to smooth across. Now, that takes us to the late 90s. Well, that was 20 years ago. So, the new Bayesian stuff that's super more interesting and exciting is the stuff that uses latent class models. To, to address two of the assumptions. There was another assumption that we haven't talked about yet, um, which is that every element in the population has some similar probability of being captured. Everything in N has some non-zero probability of being captured by project A. What if it doesn't? I mean, it, independent of its probability of being captured by B. We've dealt really, I think, thoroughly with the list uh, dependency assumption. That we can handle. Okay? Even, we could even handle that in the frequentist approach, even if it wasn't a really great way to handle it. It was still, we, had, we got most of, the, most of the problems smoothed out there. The latent class model says, look, we can actually deal with both, this is called capture heterogeneity, capture probability heterogeneity, and list dependence. We can handle it at the same time by finding the latent class which divides all the data in a stratum into chunks in which the independence model works. Now you don't have to do all this crazy smoothing across all the possible models which actually brings another very subtle set of assumptions involved. Now you don't have to do that. Yeah, you're just, you're just basically, you're, just, you're separating the data into some number of latent classes in a stratum, estimating the independence model for each one of those classes, and you are good to go. Now that, the LCMCR package is just brand new. I think it's only been out for three weeks. But the guy who wrote it is a, is a Peruvian guy who worked on the Peruvian project with us and was so inspired by that project, he went and got a PhD in statistics and is now a professor of statistics at uh, University of Indiana Bloomington. So uh, he's a great guy, Daniel Manrique Valier. Um, anyway, Daniel's package, what it does is it, it, it does this separation, does this LCM, this latent class model uh, estimate, and then um, you know, gives, you, gives you again a, a sample from the posterior and you can do all the Bayesian Folder all with it. We're not done. So the next step then is to say, wait, wait a minute. What happens if some records have zero probability of being documented? Okay. So one of the things we know is that these models are always going to be biased downward. Because there's always going to be some cases, and we don't know how many, and that, that's a problem. Okay. There's always going to be some cases that have a zero probability of being reported. They're completely hidden. And that may be because 
they, the killers were incredibly efficient, or it may be because the people who know about that death are really, really profoundly mistrustful of all the projects doing documentation and are going to go to great lengths to not interact with them. Okay? Or they moved to Los Angeles. Yeah, the moving to Los Angeles problem is a huge issue for us in Central America because the people we need to talk to, they live in LA. They don't, they don't actually live in Highland Guatemala anymore. So what do we do? Um, I guess we could go to LA, but uh, that's too much to ask, even for a human rights activist. So, um, so what we do is we say, OK, well, how can we model what that lower bound of probability is and how big it is? Is there a way to do that? And so that's where the current statistical research is on this topic, the, from the mathematical statisticians, is they're figuring out how to do that. So that may have been a longer answer than you wanted, but there you go. What was the question over here? What was the deal? What was that? OK, sure. Thank you for a really, a really interesting talk. Um, so I have a question about um, the role of like um, kind of qualitative research um, in all of this. I'm actually an anthropologist, but I'm getting um, a concurrent like masters in statistics alongside it. So oh, nice. Yeah, so yeah, that's nice. That's a really good combo. Right. So, like, yeah. so it would be really interesting to know your opinion about the place of synthesizing qualitative research and the kind of statistical research that you're talking about here and kind of addressing some of these issues that you brought up. That's, uh, that really is the, that is the sweet spot question, I think, for this stuff. And it's like the topic of the conference we're having tomorrow is, is actually specifically about that. And, and, I, and I call that the, what are we researching problem? Right? We look to the qualitative experts to tell us what the important questions are. And I think that that's, there are any number of useful things that qualitative researchers do. But as a quantitative researcher, the thing that I really need to know is what are we trying to figure out? What is the thing we need to learn? Yeah, sure, I, I, I know that the missing something is going to be important. But what's the stratification that I need to bring to bear that actually addresses the question that's of interest? You know, are we talking about genocide? Well, OK, I've, I've worked in you know, a lot of countries. That was interesting once. OK, are we looking for crude mortality rates? OK, I've worked in a lot of countries. That was interesting once. You know, every time we look at it, there's a different thing. And, and in Syria and in Colombia, it looks like time is the really key variable. But maybe that's not always. I mean, what's the interesting question? And to figure that out, we need the qualitative people to tell us. And then when we found something, you know, I, I've spent my whole career trying to write really efficient software to calculate that point. But I don't know why 2006 is important. Okay? So not only is it what are the questions, but how would we set up a test for it? And then what does our result mean? So I always think of qualitative work as telling us what things mean. Whereas quantitative work is about what things are. But they're both a little weak, right, in the vacuum of the other. Um, so I mean, it's, I think from a qualitative side, it's easy to seize on something that means something, but means something to uh, a marginal or irrelevant part of a much larger story that you miss because you get stuck in this part of the meaning. In quantitative work, it's, it, you can generate graph after graph after graph that's just meaningless and irrelevant and unhelpful to anyone without some guidance from people who can say, you know, the question here is, yes, please. Are those companies that are providing you with analytics software or with data? Um, with data. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Oh, okay. yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how good they are. Um, if you have more than one, you can test. <laughs> That's always going to be my answer. Is that it's it's got to be an empirical question rather than a speculation or like I hate those guys. They're really yucky, you know, because. Everybody's yucky. I mean, there's always a yucky claim you can make about something. So uh, instead, the question is, I mean, and I use data from like military intelligence services. Let's talk yucky. I mean, <laughs> I think but the, the question is not, are they yucky, but is it true? Surely something's mistaken. There's probably a bias, OK? And it's, it's likely to be inadvertent. 
I don't think the police create these biases on purpose for the most part. I think they almost always are doing it because this is what they think their job is, and they go and they do their job, and they generate this data, and it happens to be the data they get. But it doesn't occur to them that there's this, all this other stuff they could have gotten, but they didn't get because nobody trusted them. So, or nobody trusted them enough to call them and say, hey, you know, I'm, there's an aggravated assault over here. <coughs> No, you uh, thanks for an excellent talk, and thanks for the conversion on the classic, you know, there's a data generating process, and I think as sociologists, we're like, yeah, the data generating process is social, like, that's a social process, and that's what, yeah. you know, you're going to get out of it. Um, but kind of coming from a talk where there was, at the Pop Center, just like before you spoke, where somebody used a data source like that, Mexican violence, or, you know, reporting of Mexican violence, over oh. yeah, and so you, they clearly only used one, and so they found null results, and obviously they went on to do something else less interesting after that. But what would, where would somebody who is doing work like that start to think about how to fix their problem? Right? They have, mm -hmm. So you you're clearly going to say like find another data source, but is there a series of articles you point them to? Is there one you know like? Well, I'll give you a couple of I'll give you a couple of big words, and then you can start searching on them. Okay. okay. And the big words are either on the one side the method that we use, which is capture recapture, which is this very direct use of multiple data sources about the same thing. Okay. It's always going to involve multiple data sources, but sometimes there are multiple data sources about the same thing. Like I have lots of lists of deaths, and if you work on Mexican violence, come on, there's dozens of those databases. Okay. I mean, literally, dozens, and I don't even mean like local. That's without even. I can list six at the national level without even thinking about it. I don't even work on Mexico, so that's like, come on. Right. <laughs> okay. But if you can't get multiple data sources that are about the same thing, you can use a different family of methods that are usually called raking. Um, and this has gotten a lot more popular recently because there's a statistician at Columbia named Andy Gelman who has used different kinds of raking or post-stratification approaches to condition online surveys. Now, online surveys suck. Right, that's a technical term. They suck. I mean, they are absolutely unrepresentative of anyone. Okay? But what Gelman has shown is that if you know a little bit about the people taking the survey, you can reweight the survey results and get reasonably plausible answers. You see the guy who writes the Bayesian blog? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, and he has you know the two gigantic textbooks about Bayesian data analysis. I mean, they're just like they're boom, you know. And look. That one of those two methods will get you a long way out of the bias trap. Okay? It's not going to get you all the way out of the bias trap, probably. Okay? As I just described, the method that we use we know has a downward bias, and it may be a downward bias that varies by stratum, which would still be affecting our results. Okay? Um, we don't know, and we're not entirely sure how to even test for it yet, and we're still just working on those methods. But look, it's a lot better than using the raw data, okay? because you know, you, you're starting to change, the marginal changes get smaller and smaller as you go along here. You know, just even using the simplest frequentist approaches, we fixed most of the problem. Now that we're using these much more advanced Bayesian methods, well, there's two advantages. One is that you get, I think the estimates are better, but much more importantly is that the, the variances are much easier to explain. The error is much, much, much more comprehensible when I explain it to people who aren't statisticians. I don't even know what a frequentist confidence interval means. And I don't think anybody actually ever really knew what those things meant. So what, are, what was it we were talking about? We spent an awful lot of effort trying to calculate variances. What is it we did? No, oh, I mean, repeat the experiment. I'm trying to say, what? <laughs> okay, so, but the Bayesian, Bayesian, so we get this much, there's, there's all this other value we get from a Bayesian approach that isn't just the improvement in the estimate. But, but that improvement's also significant because it enables all those additional ways to think about it. And I think especially in the raking context, well, in a ranking contest, you can make arbitrarily complicated Bayesian models and bring all kinds of stuff into that modeling. And that's what, that's what Gelman and his collaborators, I think, have been doing a lot lately. And I think that probably most problems are going to benefit more from ranking than from multiple systems estimates, because it's rare that you're going to have multiple measures of exactly the same thing the way we do in our homicide analysis. But it's going to be really likely and common that you're going to have linking variables between different kinds of data sets that will eventually get you to one that you think is unbiased with respect to the variables of your interest. Okay? Even if it's way over there and it's two linkages away, you can still use it to condition down the, train, down the chain to reweight the stuff that you are interested in. So I think it's going to be one of those two. There's probably more. Those are the two I know about, and they're, they're, they're reasonably, I think, happening now. I mean, this, you can do them. You can read articles about them. And, and the math is there. You know? I don't know that 
I mean, for our stuff, there's actually, you know, like our packages. I mean, it's just like, you know, let's put it in there and push a button at this point. But I, for Gelman stuff, I think you're still writing the models yourself. But, you know, that's not such a big deal. You're a grad student. Come on. Mm. That, the person I'm going to tell that to is a you know, faculty member. So they'll, they'll probably get a grad student to do it anyway. <laughs> As it should be. All right. And then we'll publish it without your name. Yay! <laughs> Sorry. I, 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 um, thanks so much. Um, I, I had to I had to step out, so I, I apologize for my interesting repetition. First, I wanted to just thank you so much for the call. It's just a really earnest call for taking really seriously what these statistics mean and the power of them, and I think we don't do that enough, and it's really refreshing to hear. So first, thank you, and I and I want that echo to be to be larger. Um, so I work on I work in Mexico and Colombia. I work I, I look at judicial statistics around homicides and disappearances, which is that's where I'm coming from. Um, I, so I guess one of the questions I have um, in your model. So and, and I'm and I'm a mainly a qualitative scholar, and mm -hmm. I'll talk about afterwards. But so one of the questions I have is in your model. Do you have? Are you is perpetrator? Are you is perpetrator don't know. anywhere? Nowhere. We don't have that variable. Okay, right. Nobody knows. Right. So I, I guess I, so. I, the only thing. So I'm fascinated. Want to hear more? The only thing I was I I was kind of that that um, triggered me was what you were saying about the about the. In terms of the peace process and what's going to happen with the with the FARC demobilization, so is that a, is that data based? Is that coming from? No, it's just from here. It's okay. just knowing what okay. happened to the Paris. Okay. So, but in terms of the causal mechanisms, like of what's going on? I don't know. So, uh, okay. Causal? Okay. I don't know. What, I don't even know what causality means. Yeah. yeah I don't know. Like, yeah. I don't know. But you were saying. I got. I got okay. line though. Okay. It goes up. Right. Yeah, it goes right. up. Right. Nothing's going up. But so, but paramilitary <laughs> demobilization is kind of, I think, a total fraud and a, and, a, and just designed for to increase impunity and. And and kind of have the peace run away with the power. That's what I would say. With the power yep. thing. That's different. So you're saying, but you're saying. And, uh, I think that's good. Right, right, right. That's good. Right. But yeah. so you're. But so in terms of what you think is going to happen with the with the with the geez, with the girls demobilized, and that's not coming out of this. It's just. No, I, I just I think that what, I think it's really really likely that um, there's a there's such a strong political um, need to, to 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 say it worked mm -hmm. that there's. Yeah. Okay. The, that we're going to need to document it, and we can't now because now, uh, Medicina Legal and the Policia Nacional and the Fiscalia all coordinate their data sets. So we're done. This all ended in 2011. We can't do it again. Right. It's because now we have one data set that comes out of all three of those institutions, and the CCJ is closed. Right. And the the, and the DAS, database is done. The database is done. Uh, the people who ran the database yep. work for. I know. They work for the UN mission now. Yep. You know, Ana Maria Quintero and right. Ana Maria Diaz. They work. Right. They're, they're my students right. um, way back in the day. Okay, and that was my other question about so like the civil society groups that you're talking about in Columbia are all, that we're doing this documentation are all yeah, they're done. done. No, well, not, I, I think they're the, they're the less part of the problem. It's the state agencies that are done. That's the bigger part of the problem. That because now, because Policia Nacional is coordinating with Medicina Legal and with the Fiscalia, we only have one data set where we used to have three. Okay, and the DOS is gone. Now, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but they had a really great database yeah. that I managed to get hold of. So <laughs> yeah. I had five. Now we have one. Can't do it anymore. We're stuck. Now I don't think that the reason that we is, I'm not suggesting anything like there was any manipulation. I don't think that's why they did it. I, I mean, I know the bureaucrats. I've met with the bureaucrats who run those databases in those three institutions, and they were horrified when I explained this to them. They're like, "Oh no, what have we done?" And I'm like, "Too late now." And they're like, "Yep." It sure is, because nobody's going back to doing it independently now. Right. So. Okay. Yeah. So crap your data, and we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, and we, we got nothing. Great. Yay. Uh, just like Jana said, thank you very much for coming, and I appreciate uh, the message that you're putting out there. I hope this links back a little bit to your question. You mentioned um, one of the ways to do rigorous statistics is um, random sampling. But of course, there's all of the difficulties associated with that. Do you, I mean, I don't want to ask too broad of a question, but do you either have a, a particular case that you can point to that where random sampling in the case of human rights abuses was really well done, or you mentioned all of the difficulties? I can think of tons, but maybe there's one you would like to discuss or something. I would just like to hear more about what you have to say around. Okay, so the first really hard part of random sampling is that uh, it's hard to interview people who are victims of homicide. You hardly ever do it. So who do you, who are you, what are you really doing, right? You're not interviewing dead people. You're sampling people who can tell you about dead people. 
So what's the sampling probability link between the person you sampled and the death? Okay. Now epidemiologists try to get around this in retrospective mortality surveys by these household rules where they say, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to sample a household, then we know the sampling probability of the household, and then we're going to ask people in the household about people who died in that household while they all lived together. And so they have these short recall periods, okay, um, almost never longer than 18 months, and they are really focused on uh, you know, the simplicity of the probability link. And people have done that, um, done a lot of them. They're sometimes called retrospective mortality surveys. Um, and they've run into a peck of trouble. And the most famous of these infinitely long flame wars, oh, they're awful, they're just, uh, is between uh, an epidemiologist at Columbia, uh, who was then at Johns Hopkins but now is at Columbia, um, named Les Roberts, and uh, an economist in Britain, uh, a guy named Mike Spaggett. And the debate basically goes like this. Uh, Roberts and his collaborators from Johns Hopkins did some surveys in Iraq, uh, 2004, and then I think in 2006. And they published, and they did these retrospective mortality surveys where basically you sample the households and you cluster sampling across the, so you have multi-stage sampling and then you sample within each cluster and then you, uh, you know, assume that the, you've got the clusters sampled correctly and then you, you make an estimate. And it's basically all just multiplication. I mean, it doesn't have to be. And to their credit, and something that I think has been lost in the debate in the second survey, the one that I think is, is, is the more interesting and the more controversial of the two, um, one of the things they did is they did a very uh, conservative error estimate. Okay? In fact, it was so conservative that basically the error estimate reached from how many people have died in excess mortality. Another, it's not homicides. It's people who died who would not have died in the absence of conflict. So, that, so what's the baseline? How are you doing that subtraction? I, I don't have any idea. Um, but, and they came up with this 600 or 650,000 dead in two, as of 2006. And people were like, okay, that can't be true. Because they, they came out and they were also, they, the way that they presented the results was very political. It was a critique of the US invasion. And people said, no, that's inappropriate for scientists to be so openly political. Um, and we think you did the math wrong. And there are two critiques of the math that I think are interesting. One was that if people, if the sampling process in some way had been, had oversampled large thoroughfares in cities relative to back streets, it's possible that people on large thoroughfares had higher mortality than people on back streets because the violence, because there may have been more violence on large thoroughfares. And there was a paper that was written by Spaggett and a number of collaborators uh, in the Political Science Journal, I can't remember which one now, which won an award, it was a big deal. It always struck me as highly speculative. It, I, I don't feel that it made its point because what the principal critique is coming from that position is that the number of deaths estimated by the surveys were so much greater than the numbers documented in sources like the Iraq body count. That's the principal sort of objection that then drives this technical critique. Well, these people have gone back and forth and back and forth and back and forth for a decade. And I think that the critiques have been largely overblown. Um, I am not convinced by them. They sound great, but when you really start investigating, you're like, well, that doesn't make sense. And well, that's explainable in five other ways. You know, and and the, the larger piece of those critiques is that the Many people have decided that the, there was extensive fabrication or fraud in, that, in the Lancet. The survey was published in the Lancet, so it's sometimes called the Johns Hopkins Lancet Survey by Roberts Burnham et al. And I am not convinced of the fraud critique. I think there's other ways that the patterns that they found could be explained. It's not clear to me how we would distinguish between the various explanations, and it seems to me that we should be very, very confident of fraud before we make an allegation of that kind. Uh, so I'm not convinced by that. Um, I am also not convinced by this so-called Main Street bias argument, which seems to me to be largely driven by the sense that violence in Iraq was the product of Al-Qaeda, rather than this other conflict which we're pointing to. Okay. So we use the Lancet survey as a way to worry about errors in surveys in general, okay, because surveys are very fragile. 
one of the things about random sampling is if you get a couple of bad sample survey results, your results can completely go haywire uh, because you're going to multiply all those results by sampling weights and a few bad results, especially in uh, clusters where your sampling probabilities are very small and consequently your weights are large, could just blow your results you know, all over the map. And it can be hard to tell. So small amounts of fabrication can really, really damage survey results in important ways. Or it doesn't have to be deliberate fabrication. It could be small results of non-sampling error can create, uh, can create what could manifest as a bias. So that's really hard. When you say fabrication, do you mean like blatantly making things up or just like making a, a very big assumption about? Um, well, that, if it happens by the people doing the survey in the field, then it's fabrication no matter which of those two it is. And I think that making a big assumption like, I don't want to go down that street. I'm just going to sample a household that's right here. Okay? And that's the kind of claim that the Main Street people made. It's like, we're, di we're just going to stay on the Main Streets. We're just, we're just essentially, I, I, I sometimes call this the enumerator laziness critique. Yeah, but if, it, if that's true, I don't understand why it wouldn't work the other way around. Because if the claim is that the enumerators then sampled households that were subject to more violence, thereby leading to an overestimate in the final result, wouldn't they have gone to the places that were safer? So it doesn't, so it's a laziness thing rather than a security thing. And I've never really followed, you know, I've, I've heard Spaggot presented a couple of times and I'm, I just, I, it, there's too much heat, not enough light, honestly, in this debate. There's way more heat than there is light, by the way. So when you get into it, it's just the vituperativeness of the debate is, is astonishing. Um, and there was a very, very uh, unfortunate public session at the American Statistical Association meetings in 2000. Seven, I think, 2007 or 2008, in which finally the association had to step in and say, OK, this is ad hominem. Let's back down. Okay. And it came from the same people making these critiques, in particular uh, this guy, this economist. So that stuff worries me. Um, I don't know what the answer is. Um, and I'm not exactly sure how to do it in a homicide context, because homicide's a rare event even in very violent societies. So even in a genocide context, we're talking about the, the most violent population I've ever surveyed or worked with or engaged with was 5% over 18 months, okay, was their total, their total crude mortality rate due to homicide. That's, that's genocide. I mean, that's, that's, you know, but that still means you have to sample 20 households before you find someone, right? So it still makes it challenging in a, in a, in a, uh, in a survey context to get enough, to get your sample done in a way that actually produces it. In Timor-Leste, my colleagues and I did a different kind of retrospective mortality survey in which instead of, um, it was, uh, instead of, um, I mean, Timor-Leste is small and we had a big sample of 1,440 households. So we were able to sample uh, across the island proportional to population size and we were able to get everywhere and do it. But the way we did the interview was really different. We didn't ask about people who died in the household. We asked about colonial relatives. So the way we did it is we asked each interviewee um, about her parents, her siblings, and her children. And when and where were they born? And if they have died, when, where, and how did they die? Okay. Now what this does is this creates a much bigger modeling problem, right? Because if we're asking a head of household about her siblings, well, she probably doesn't just have one sibling. This is a high fertility society. So she's going to have several siblings. Okay? And that means that there are other households that if one of them has died, there are other households we might have sampled who could tell us about that. So there's this disconnect between the sampling probability of the death and the sampling probability of the respondent, which means that you have to, when you're trying to get to the sampling prob probability of the death, you have to model it. And you have to model it by the family structure of the respondent. So you have to model the probability of having sampled that death as a function of her family structure at each level, okay, for her parents, her siblings, and her children, for each of those layers of deaths you report. So now you have an additional modeling, additional uncertainty that's introduced by modeling into your estimates, which is very frustrating. And what we found is that while that approach worked pretty well for um, deaths due to hunger and disease, an illness and, and, and accident, but mostly it was disease. Those worked really well because that was a common event. Lots and lots and lots and lots of people died as a result of hunger and, and, and disease. Not so many people died by violence. 
Many, many fewer, in fact, 20 times fewer than activists who'd worked on East Timor claimed. Um, we found about 20,000, 18,000 plus minus deaths due to homicide by the Indonesian army, the Indonesian presence. And uh, about 85 to 90,000 deaths over this period from 1975 to 1999. Uh, due to hunger and illness that were in excess of what we would expect uh, based on the uh, pre-invasion uh, crude mortality. So, you know, that's another approach. But that approach didn't get us to a plausible violence estimate. For the violence estimate, we had to fall back to other methods. And we went back to our multiple systems estimate kind of approach. So, I don't know. Random sampling is really going to be the right answer when you when you when every respondent has something to t someone to tell something to tell you. But in a rare event, you're going to get a mess. It's it's really really hard. And since most violence is elusive and rare, we're going to need other things. Now there's network sampling approaches that are really interesting that I think have a lot of promise that we haven't really explored yet. Um, we have tried, but we didn't. It didn't work. We did did a project in Punjab looking at people disappeared uh, by the Indian authorities uh, in the Sikh insurgency. And we did a network-based sampling approach. I don't know that it worked. Uh, we never published it because we were not convinced enough that we thought it was actually right. But I wonder if there's more there. I think there might be more there. And figuring out if, if as we learn more about how to model people's social networks, we will learn more about what an individual respondent is able to tell us. And looking at the overlap of social networks among multiple respondents sampled in a relatively dense network, we can start figuring out where those network holes are, and we can figure out in a much more thoughtful and, and, and fluid way how to make estimates from network samples. But I think network sampling is probably, for, for rare events, for elusive events, like, like homicide and disappearance, um, that's going to be the right way. Now I have a couple other ideas about uh, sampling-based approaches for these kind of, that they aren't straight up go sample households at random, because you're just, it's, just, it's just too hard. You're going to run into the same problems the Lancet people ran into. And I just, I, I don't know. I don't know that I think that's fixable. So. Thank you. Okay. I think, if I may, maybe we should move to our conclusion. But before we all disperse, I want to ask you one thing that shifts it a little bit. Do you have the energy? Yeah, sure. Oh my gosh, we'll wait Never has lack of energy. <laughs> so, uh, there, I think, from my vantage point, there are at least two themes to this talk. One of them has been the dominant theme of the discussion, that is, how is it that we could think about using statistics more effectively, mm -hmm. more adequately, more accurately. But the second thing is a larger question, which is part of what we're going to continue to work on. And that is, what are the obstacles to actually creating this very kind of conversation we have in the room today? Mm -hmm. And what are the pathways by which we can mobilize these conversations in the future? That's a huge, at least day-long, if not month-long, if not year-long conversation. But I wonder if you could just give a taste of one or two obstacles that you see that you know, deserves to be overturned. And secondly, one or two examples of how it has been overturned in terms of the dialogue between those who know substantively and those who might help us with a more rigorous science. Right. So. My model qualitative intellectual is a prosecutor, okay? because it's really important to me that they get it. Because if they don't, trial, not, well, not, the trial may not fail, but my evidence is going to fail. And it did. I, I told Michael on the way over here, you know, I've, I've been in six trials. I'm five for six, okay? uh, basically, I think. And the one that I, that I lost, the one I got, I got beat in, there are a lot of different reasons I got beat. But one of the key reasons is that I was unable for whatever reason, uh, many of which were my own fault, uh, I was unable to communicate to the prosecutor what it was really that I was arguing. And the prosecutor understood my results to be proving that the Serbs did it in this, it was in Kosovo. And I was like, no, no, <laughs> no, I, I got nothing like that, no. What I'm showing is that it wasn't NATO and it wasn't the KLA. Was it the Serbs? Maybe, I've got an interesting coincidence suggesting that it was the Serbs. But that's not what I found. But he didn't understand that. So all of his leading of my evidence took me toward that. And the judge was like, wait, you're not saying it was proven. And I'm like, no, of course not. It's not proven. That's not." And the judge was offended and furious. The judge felt somehow I'd been hiding something or that somehow, because the judge isn't going to read your report. They're busy. Even though 
the second sentence of the report says, this is not proof that, doesn't matter. And when I pointed that out to him, he was even more offended. Because then he was embarrassed that you know, I was showing that he hadn't done his homework. That's not good. That, again, I screwed this up too. But you need to have a really clear connection with the qualitative people that you're working with to make sure that they know what it is you can say and what you can't say. And it's, you know, I, I spoke to a, 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 law cl a, a class of law students who are trying to think about they want to be war crimes prosecutors someday. And I was like, well, they're like, well, what can you prove? And I'm like, that's not actually how science works. Science doesn't prove. Science rejects. Okay, what we do is knock down all these other theories. Okay? And then we say, well, this, the data may be consistent with your claim. That's as strong as we get. Then we stop. And they're like, well, that's not enough. And I'm like, then you're not working hard enough. It's your job to build a case. It is not the scientist's job to do everything for you. The scientist's job is to present a very specific piece in which we reject a series of other hypotheses. And then maybe affirm that the evidence, the statistical evidence is consistent with the, you know, in, in the genocide case in Guatemala, we're affirming that the, the, the relative risk of being indigenous is eight times greater than being non-indigenous where the risk is being killed by the army during the tenure of the defendant when he was the president. Okay, okay. that's an eight times differential in the probability of being killed. That's huge. That's a big deal. You know? But that's not proof that it was genocide. There, could, there are other ways, there are other explanations that might lead to that outcome. That's not my job. I can't deal with those things. All I can say is the differential is there. A lot of people got killed, and they got killed in this pattern. And that's what you use the scientist for. So there's this. And in the first Kosovo case, I had a prosecutor who, for whatever reason, got it instantly, led me perfectly, deflected everything that came that wasn't what I was saying. You know, and every time the defense would try, and it, the defense in that case was actually Milosevic, who was his own defense attorney, was trying to say all kinds of crazy stuff, the prosecutor would get up and say, Your Honor, that's not what the witness has said. You know, can we, can we please move on here? But he kept reinforcing that so I didn't have to do it, so the judge didn't get mad at me. You know, that's the prosecutor's job to do that. So at some level, the difference between it working and not working is having a rapport and actually an understanding between the qualitative side and the quantitative side. That's not really the right answer. It'd be nice if there were a structurally more coherent answer, but that is probably the answer. <laughs> that's the perfect way to end the conversation to exhibit this mode of process. So would you all join me in thanks and have a Thank you very much. Thanks for sticking around. If you want a sticker, come get a sticker. And by the way, the tagline is everybody counts. It's a little, there's a slightly macabre joke in there. Uh, everybody counts. So if you would like a sticker, please. <laughs>